Right, what we're going to talk about in this lecture is origins, and for that we need a little bit more biochemistry and a little bit more genetics, and it gets a little bit more complicated. So if you're feeling sleepy, I suggest you shake your heads or something, go brr, 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 wake up, take a deep breath, get some oxygen flowing over there. And it's not important that you know anything about the formulas. It's not important whether you understand the genetics or anything like that. I'm going to try and bring it right down to the level where everybody will get something. So just relax, get the basic principles of it, and if you get the basic principles, that's enough. For the scientists and the medical doctors and, and the biochemists and what have you, please bear with me, I'm not going to go into the heavy biochemistry. That's not the point of this lecture. We could do it if we had to, but we don't want to. Right, Charles Darwin, at the time of the voyage of the Beagle, was the one who proposed that animals evolved through natural selection. He said that animals had, that had long necks, like this one over here, had a selective advantage over those that had shorter necks, because at the lower levels there were other animals in competition for food resources, and so he said that those with longer necks were the ones that would have the selective advantage and have a greater probability of surviving. Other people came up with different scenarios, like Lamarck, for example, who said, no, 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 it works like this. If you want to reach the top and you really stretch your neck to get there, eventually the neck will grow. <laughs> All right, that was Lamarckism. And Darwinism was far more scientific. Of course, Lamarckism, if that were true, if you flapped your arms long enough, eventually you'd fly, right? <laughs> we know that Lamarckism is not true. So how did Darwinism start? And Darwin himself was not really a pushy kind of fellow. Here is Darwin. He was a quiet, sort of reserved guy. But this man over here, Huxley, became known as Darwin's bulldog. He's the one who pushed the theory, fought the battles, and broke down the barriers. Now, how did it all start? Well, it started with the voyage of the Beagle. Charles Darwin, well armed with a book written by another Charles, Charles Lyell, under his arm, was on the voyage of the Beagle. He could do this because his wife was extremely wealthy, and so he could live a life of leisure. He didn't have to work like the rest of everybody else. And then he traveled around the world, and the main idea was to draw maps of South America, and he was the naturalist. He also had a theological background, and so he went to these islands of the Galapagos, and here he saw some amazing things which make, made him rethink his whole philosophy. Firstly, he had Charles Lyell's books, which talked about millions of years for the geological features, so long ages were in his mind. He also knew the Bible, but the mindset of people at that time was that God had created immutable, unchangeable species. Each kind was a species, and God had created them, every single one, just like that. Now, Linnaeus was the one who drew the maps and the, the whole system of binomial nomenclature. Two names for every species, like we are Homo sapiens, you know. And so he had that idea. And if something had three rows of scales, it was one species. And if it had an extra row, it was another species. If something had this color, it was one species. If it had another color, it was another species. And God created, boom, 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 each one unchangeable, immutable. That was the idea. So we have millions of species on the planet. Of course, that raises the question, how do they all fit into the ark? Is that right? Okay. Now the question is, did God create immutable, unchangeable species, or did he not? 
when Darwin was here on the Galapagos Islands over there, he saw, amongst other things, these finches. And Darwin's finches, of course, are very famous because finches on the Galapagos Islands have different structural features to meet different needs. So some of them have very large beaks, some of them have very small beaks, and they're very diversified. So some of them can uh, eat little seeds, some of them insects, some of them can even use tools like this one over here, using a tool to catch termites and bugs between the bark, and some of them had strong beaks for cactus seeds and things like this. But these were finches. Now songbirds this, did this type of thing on the mainlands, but here on the islands it was finch. So the idea came to Darwin, now is it not probable that all these different finches were derived from a common finch ancestor, and that over time they had changed to adapt to these various food habitats and whatever they did. And so the idea grew further and he said, well, if this is so, then God did not create, but it came through naturalistic evolution. And the idea of evolution by natural selection was born right here. Now remember, he did know nothing, he knew nothing about genetics, nothing. Gregor Mendel had actually done his work already, his pioneering work, but it was hidden in the dust of some monastery. Nobody knew about genetics. So all he had was anatomy. Does that make sense to you? He didn't know anything about genetics. And so when he said, did God create this? He couldn't have because they must have come from a common ancestor. He threw creation out and evolution took place, took its place. The question he should have asked himself is, did God really create immutable, unchangeable species? Let's go into that into some detail. We know that science says life began on this planet in the, in the early times by various gases reducing atmospheres coming into existence around our planet. And if you pass sparks through that, you get various organic materials that you can trap and uh, that's how the organic matter arose on this planet. Trouble is that you would have to have all the conditions just right for those molecules to form. And they get destroyed the minute they are formed, the split second they are formed, so you have to remove them from the atmosphere, major problem. Also, the present atmosphere, if you look down there, has oxygen in it, so it is a reduce, it's not a reducing atmosphere, it's an oxidizing atmosphere, and those molecules for life would never, able, would never be able to be formed. And if you look at the primitive earth, as they say what it looked like, you will see that it has water. If it has water, we know that water will be struck by cosmic rays if there is no ozone layer, if there was no oxygen, like they say, then there was no ozone. If there was no ozone, then the water would be struck by these cosmic radiation and it would split into oxygen and hydrogen. So if you have water, you always have oxygen. So you can never have an atmosphere like that without oxygen. So you run into major, major problems how life came into existence. If you take the amino acids in our system, in our body that we need, all living organisms need amino acids, they have nitrogen in them. Now where do they get the nitrogen from? Now they have to get it from ammonia out of the atmosphere. If you take these structures which are in our DNA, they also have nitrogen in them, but for ring structures like that to form, all the nitrogen has to be changed to hydrogen cyanide. Wow! So now you have no nitrogen up there, you have everything in cyanide form. For the amino acids you need everything as ammonia. If you want the sugars to form, like you have in DNA, for example, you cannot get them if, there's, if there is ammonia in the atmosphere. Big problem. You need totally different conditions for everything to form. So the probability of it happening is so remote as for all intents and purposes to be non-existent. To get the molecules, even if they could form, to form macromolecules, to join up, tip, 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 and to make the strings that we have in our DNA or in our proteins, 
The probability is infinitesimally small. It has never been demonstrated because you need enzymes to do this. So how do you get an enzyme to form if you don't have an enzyme to do what you want the enzyme to do in the first place? You get my drift? So let's talk probabilities. Let us assume, let us assume that you have a bomb which is placed under a huge stack of wood and you have an explosion and it goes boom what is the probability that the splinters will fall down and form a perfect little house <laughs> with functioning windows and doors and everything just immaculate what is the probability well it's extremely remote would you agree all right but if you look at science let's say the probability is one to the number of particles in the entire universe. How many atoms in your fingertip? Billions, right? Zillions, billions and billions and billions and billions and zillions. So how many atoms in this room? How many atoms in the entire universe? Wow! How many, not even atoms, particles, protons, hadrons, quarks, neutrons, electrons in the entire universe? Every galaxy, every gas cloud, every planet, every single thing in the entire universe. How many of those particles? I'll tell you, 10 to the power of 80. Doesn't look very big, right? It's a massive figure. The probability of the molecules coming into existence, the probability of the molecules forming life is far greater than even that. So we're not talking boom little house, we're talking Boom, New York City. <laughs> Do you believe it? With escalators working, no problem. That's the type of probability we're talking about. Dobskansky once worked it out that from one species to go to another would take a hundred, would take a hundred generations or a thousand generations, whichever way you wanted it, with at least a hundred or a thousand either way point mutations. So that is 100 to the power of 1,000. That is such a huge number, you don't even want to begin because it's the number of particles in billions and billions and billions and billions and billions and billions, and billions for eternity universes. <laughs> Impossible. Now science has an easy way of dealing with this. Very easy way. There's a book called The Blind Watchmaker which says, who cares? The fact is that we are here, therefore it happened. <laughs> right? But I just want to show you in this lecture how far we have to go to believe in this process called chance. DNA contains, this is a DNA molecule, contains all the information as to who and what we are. Is that right? And every organism contains that same DNA. Now that DNA we call our genotype. So that genotype is all the genes present in that first cell. So what comes together from father and mother, that's what we have in our genes, that's our genotype. Phenotype is what you actually are. Which genes are expressed and what you look like. All right? Let me explain that a little bit more. So this over here is the DNA on the left, that's the genotype. And on the right is what that individual looks like, that's the phenotype. Everybody with me? You know those two words now? Genotype, phenotype? Okay, remember them. Genotype, phenotype. Example. A law in evolution says natural selection operates only at the level of the phenotype. All right? It only operates at the level of the phenotype. That's the one on the right there. At the level of the genotype, what happens there happens by chance. So at the genotype level, everything happens by chance through mutation. Are you with me? So everything happens there by chance, and at the phenotype level, what comes in? Natural selection. Simple example. Two people walking in the Kruger National Park in South Africa. The one is short and fat. The other one is lean and muscular and powerful, like me, for example. 
and you're walking along and a lion jumps out from behind the bush and you take off like greased lightning, what is the probability of which one surviving? Which one will most likely survive? The lean one. Which means that you must always take someone short and fat with you when you go to these <laughs> dangerous places. Okay, so that's natural selection. It selects between the one that is more fit to cope with that situation than the other one. Are you with me? All right, the lion doesn't ask, excuse me, have you got any other genes in your gene system that haven't been expressed here? He doesn't care. He just cares whether you run fast or whether you don't. Is that right? All right, so natural selection happens at the level of the phenotype. At the level of the genotype, everything happens by chance. Have you got that? Okay. Here I have, therefore, to put it in simple language, a book. And this book we'll call our genotype. The book contains the instructions of how to build aeroplanes. So that is what? Genotype. And once the aeroplane has actually been built, that is phenotype. Now I have a question for you. Who wrote the book? <laughs> Who wrote the book? You have two chances. It was either chance or it was a designer. Are you with me? Because what happens at the level of the genotype? It's chance. Or you have another option, which is design. All right. So now you have this great book which tells you how to build an airplane. And the book is on my shelf. Now, how long will I have to sit and watch the book before the airplane actually appears? <laughs> well, how long would you reckon? forever, right? But the aeroplane has to come into existence before I can see whether it works or whether it doesn't work. Are you with me? Yeah. So all the processes that translate what is written there into that take place by which two means? Chance or design. Okay. The probability of the book having been written is boom, New York, New York, New York, New York, New York. Boom, New York, New York, New York, New York, New York. Over and over and over again. For every single gene, I have to assume that this was chance. The mechanisms to make it, also chance. So if we take that to the cellular level, our DNA is so complicated in the way that it is read. I will leave that one. The way in which we take the information of there to the factory, the ribosomes which make the product, the protein, all of it had to come about by chance. Because the, the final fellow must be there before I know whether he works or d that he doesn't work. So now let's say I've written the book and I want to make some changes to the book. Any change that I write in the book, how does it have to come about? By chance, through mutation. All right? So any modification in that genotype to bring about any change in the phenotype must come about by chance. So people will say, well, all these things are mutations, like a lighter animal or a darker animal or a this animal or a that animal. Let's have a look at mutations. You get various types of mutations. Simple one, as an example, would be a point mutation where you take one of the letters in DNA and replace it. So you have DNA is a triplet code. We have how many letters in our alphabet? 26, 26 letters, and we can use them individually. DNA has only four letters, and it uses them in groups of three. So I can take a letter out, and I can add a letter, and I can get all these things happening over there. Let me simplify that for lay people. So let's make a triplet code, the cat and the hat. And let's say I have a mutation where I cut out the C, then I would read them in threes as well, the atta hundete he at. Are you with me? So is the mutation good or is it not so good? 
So mutations are generally harmful. Even the ones that are so-called positives, like those that call sickle cell anemia, still make you sick. You get sickle cell anemia. It's a negative mutation. Uh, this slide over here of mutations has got nothing to do with mutations. It's just there to amuse you because I thought it looked cute. <laughs> All right, now let's go through evolutionary thinking here. Evolution says, sometime in the midst of time, by boom, little house, boom, little house, boom, little house, the first molecules came into existence. Is that right? And then by boom, New York, they started forming the first little cells. Now the first little cell is there. This is now Haeckel's Gastrea theory. So there's your first little cell. And it has DNA, simple DNA, that says, you look like this. Okay? Then he says the cells started sticking together, then they formed the ball, then it formed the dent, and that's the basic body plan of all living animals. But you know, it's not as simple as that. He then went on to say all kinds of things about embryos recapitulating uh, the evolutionary process, which has been discounted, and we haven't got time to go into that. And then he says that mutations and changes over time will be what brings about change. So let's say you had this first cell, and there's a gene which says you look like that, and you mutate the gene, then the cell could look different, and it could look like this one over there on this side. Are you with me? Okay, but that's not what we want. What's the difference between me and an amoeba? Well, I hope you see a difference. <laughs> the difference is simply this. That's a unicellular creature. It's not a multicellular creature. What am I? I'm multicellular. I've got lots of cells. Do I have more DNA requirements than an amoeba? Yes or no? Of course. Now let's take a simple example. There's a muscle cell and there's a nerve cell. Does an amoeba have a muscle cell and a nerve cell? No, it's just a blob cell, right? Doesn't have a muscle cell, doesn't have a nerve cell. When I get more complicated and I start getting multicellular and I get specialization of cells, how do I get the cells in here to be nerve cells and the cells in here to be muscle cells? Well, you see, what happens is every single cell in my body has all the DNA it takes to be any other cell. Is that right? When I start off with the the simple germ cell, the unification of the male and the female germ cell, that cell has all the genes for every cell. So the genes which say nerve cell are switched on in here and they're switched off in here. Are you with me? Okay, let's think about that. So let's say there must be, if there's a muscle cell, there must be a whole host of them, but let's make it very simple. Let's say a gene which says, hello there, you're a muscle cell. Is that right? Are you with me? And there must be a gene which also says, hello there, you are a nerve cell. Did the amoeba, the first creature, have that gene? So I have a question for you. Where does this extra gene now that the original one didn't have and didn't need, where does it come from? You have two choices. It had to come about by chance. Now for one gene to come about by chance, even let's say it makes a protein that has 300 amino acids, there are four letters in it, so it's four to the power of 300. That's about 10 to the power of 127. That is boom, challenger rocket. Ready to take off fully loaded to the moon with a satellite on it in functional condition. That is the probability. Now I have no problem if you want to believe that, but you could also believe in a designer, isn't that right? Because what's happening here is at the level of the genotype. Does natural selection work there, yes or no? No, it has to be by chance. But that's not enough. Hello there. If I want the gene in there to be activated which says nerve cell, and I want this powerful muscle that you see over here activated over here which says muscle cell and I want the one that says nerve cell switched off if I have two sets of lights one there and one there I want those lights on those lights off what must I have in the back a switch how many switches two all right so I need a switch I need a switching gene we call them promoter systems they're more, far more complicated than this hello you're switched on you're switched off hello there you're switched on you're switched off 
The original cell that didn't have the two cells, did it have to have the switch? Where does the switch come from? You have two choices. <laughs> Boom little house or design. One of the two. That's your choice. So can you see that as you get more and more complicated, you need one enormous amount of faith? You have to believe that an explosion going through a junkyard will really assemble a jumbo 7 or 7. You have to believe it. Or you have to believe in a design. That's what it really looks like at the gene level. Not enough. What's the point of having a nerve cell up here and a muscle cell over here if they don't work together? <laughs> Mustn't I be able to say, arm, lift yourself up. Boom. Yes or no? All right, so I need a gene, structural genes up there, which say you are a nerve cell, you are a muscle cell. I need two promoters, that's the switches. You're switched on, you're switched off. I need genes controlling the physiology, how to develop so that the one grows and works properly. I need genes controlling the embryology, that they work together. Where do all these extra genes come from? You have two choices. <laughs> Chance or design. Now. Let us say we're actually making something. Natural selection normally cuts off the extremes. Now for selection to take place, I must have how many things to choose from? At least two. What's the point of having a selection if there's only one object to choose from? Are you with me on this? If I want to go and vote for a political party, as I've said before, and there's only one party standing, is there any point in going to vote? No, you need two. So, in order for natural selection to start working, you actually have to have two products there, two aeroplanes. Now I can ask the question, which one of these two aeroplanes flies best? Are you with me? All right. So, did natural selection make anything? No, didn't make anything. It can only work what is all, with, with what is there. The two aeroplanes must be there. Where do the two aeroplanes come from in the first place? You have two choices. <laughs> Chance or design. Now I have two aeroplanes and I'm going to fly. The one goes <whistles> and the other one goes <whistles> Natural selection has favored the one at the expense of the other. Is that right? All right, so let's take the example of the peppered moth. There's the light moth and the dark moth. You put the light moth on a light background, it disappears, the black one stands out. You do the reverse, the black one disappears, the white one stands out. Eventually the birds will eat the light one. If this carries on long enough, what happens to the light one eventually? It becomes extinct. Now comes my bomber question to you. Natural selection is the god of evolution. It's the one that makes bigger and better and greater than ever before. Is that right? Now it chooses between two. One is favored, the other one goes extinct. What has it done? Has it added something or taken something away? Are you sure? Let me repeat that. Has it added something or taken something away? It's taken something away. How can a mechanism that makes less and less end up having created more and more? Does it make any sense? It doesn't make any sense. So if you look at the fossil record, there was far more there in the past than there is at present. Is that right? And are we losing species every single day? Yes or no? So natural selection is doing such a good job that soon there'll be nothing left. <laughs> it's not a good way of getting more and more. So we see that in the past, like these trees, there were far more variants than there are today. So where does everything come from? It comes from chance or design. That's your object. That's it. You have to choose that. So let's take the dog. The Great Dane from the Papillon down to the Chihuahua. This shape, that shape, this shape, that shape. All the body shapes. All the colors of the wild dogs. All these ear shapes. We know this is one species. We have Afro style hair. We have white hair. If you take the Afghan, we have blonde hair. We have every hair color, we have every hair type, we have all these things, and it's wild type wolf. 
We know that. It's one species. So all the genes that make all this variety, where do those genes come from? You have two choices. It's genotype. Chance or design. That's it. So every single allele that we have, all this variety that we have, it's chance or design. These snails over here, every single one of them was classified as a different species in the past. Today we know that one species, different genes expressed at different times. Butterflies come with different shapes and sizes and colors and different seasons. Same species, different genes activated. Where do those genes come from? So you can have one butterfly of the same, same kind, looking like this one season and like that one season. Where they come from? Boom, little house or design. That's your probability. This creature over there, this pigeon, built-in variety is massive to small, dark to light, strange to weird, all shapes and sizes, built-in variety. This beetle, black to white to large to small. This beetle, black to white to large to small, one species, the quagga. Today, we know that this quagga, which is an extinct animal, is actually not extinct at all. They found a pelt in the museum, and they found some blood vessels, sent it to the United States, did DNA analysis, and they found that the DNA is identical to the plain zebra living today. So they started a breeding program, and they're breeding the quagga back. Was it extinct? Yes or no? No. It just was a different gene expression. If you take this ladybird, it's black in the spring, and it's got the red and white and the red and black uh, structure in the fall. Two species or one species? One species. Different sets of genes. All of these are one kind. If you take the pocket mouse, white in a snowy background, dark on a rock background. Genes that oscillate from white rabbit in the winter to dark rabbit in the summer. Different expressions of the genetic potential in that animal. Also mountain lizards to coastal lizards. All these changes. We're dealing with genes. Boom little house, boom little house, boom little house or design. That's your choice. Anything that changes the genotype to give more variety must also come about by chance. And the process that is used is fertilization. So there we have it. Fertilization. Two creatures producing offspring by mixing their genes. Now I want you to think about it. Just shake your heads. <laughs> Wake up. Are you awake? All right, think. Natural selection works on what is there. Is that right? The babies have to be there. The children have to be running around. Question. Reproduction increases the variety. But natural selection only works once the babies of this process have been produced. So how did sexual reproduction, which just mixes genes, that's like rewriting the book a little bit, how did it come into existence? You have two choices. Chance or design. Now it's getting really phenomenally amazing. To run this by you, we have 46 chromosomes, is that right? 23 are from dad, 23 are from mom. They go and lie in homologous pairs like that. And during meiosis, the one can go this one, the other one can go that one, or the other way around. We call that random sorting. Just from that, I can get 2 to the power of 23 times 2 to the power of 23. That's 80 trillion different offspring. Can you imagine that? I can produce 80 trillion different children just from that process. Wow. Now, that's not enough. I can split them up like this into chromatids and then they actually swap material. Now, this is all happening at the level of the what? Genotype. All right. Now, what happens here? So I can take a little bit of dad and I can swap it with a little bit of mom and I can switch them over. So this one over here is then all dad, dad, mom, mom, dad, Mom. And I can start jumbling the genes and I can do it all over the chromosomes so that it looks like this. And by the way, 
This works like a precision machine. It is mind-bogglingly complicated. There are enzymes which twist the molecule. There are enzymes which run along it, which cut it in exactly the right space so that when you cross the genes over, you don't make a mistake. You cut one letter too far, the next gene reads... <laughs> So it's got to be precise. Boom! Clockwork. Otherwise you're going to have jumbled up kids, I'll tell you that. They wouldn't know whether they're Arthur or Martha. And all this mechanism, this complex mechanism, does nothing but increase the variety. How did it come into existence? Chance or design? Now let me tell you something. If you thought sending a man to the moon was a great feat, this is 10 million billion times more complicated than anything like that. If I had to tell you that rocket that took the people to the moon successfully and, the, and the, the one that landed, plus all the stuff that went along with it, wow, that that came about by chance, they'd lock me up. <laughs> but this is more complicated than that. There may not be one mistake or else each one of you would have been a cabbage. <laughs> And yet we must believe it came about by chance. You're welcome to believe it. I have no problem with it. But I just wanted you to realize what you're dealing with. So here we have a cave fish. Can you see that it doesn't have eyes? It's a new species. It doesn't have eyes. Let me tell you something. I think it has the genes for eyes. But being a cave fish, it doesn't need them. So the genes are what? Switched off. Deactivated. If you go to Hawaii you will find that very quickly after a new cave system or something forms in those volcanic islands, that the cockroaches move into the dark caves. And within a few generations, none of them have eyes. Do you think that's evolution, or do you think it's just deactivating the genes? It's just deactivating the genes. Look at this creature over here. These are flightless birds. We find flightless rails, we find flightless cormorants, we find flightless anything on islands. The genes are deactivated very quickly. This chicken over here is the next of the brand that will be used by plen plucky plied chicken because it doesn't have any feathers so it doesn't take any plucking. Now that could be a mutation or it could be a deactivation of genes. In some cases you can mix species like this is a lepjag, that is a liger, a mixture between a lion and a tiger. This one over here is a wolfen, a mixture between a whale and a dolphin. This one is a zos, a mixture between a, a zebra and a horse. This one is a zonkey, it's a different mixture between a zebra and a donkey. Of course, you will say their offspring is not viable. But you get fish that do that and it's viable. You get insects that do that and it's viable. And maybe there's a link here to the past. This one over here is a chimera. This is a mixture between a sheep and a goat. But because they don't sexually mix, they actually take the cell of an embryo of each, put them together, put them into a surrogate mother, and this part over here on the right over there develops as a goat. This piece over here develops as a sheep. That is a goat. That is a sheep. What's going on in the head, nobody knows. <laughs> and I always have a little joke for you, and that is, when the Lord comes to separate the sheep from the goats, I'd hate to be this guy. <laughs> That'll be an explosive experience, right? Okay, let's talk about other things. So, when you get something changing, does that necessarily mean it's evolution, or could it be switching off available information? It could be. Now, our, all our genes are on chromosomes, and sometimes... You can get chromosomes to actually join up. Like here you have a tandem fusion, you have a chromosome, and you have a small chromosome, which we call an acrosomic chromosome, and they link up. Oops. Then I have a long chromosome. But the information is exactly the same from banding studies. Can you see that? Have I changed the information? No. I've just changed the way in which it's going to separate. And now, uh, this animal here is the largest antelope in the world. It's the eland, and it has one of those. The chromosomes are fused together. And please notice that it has stripes along its side, and that it has twirled horns. This one over here is the kudu. It has stripes, and it has twirled horns. 
This one over here is the lesser kudu. It has stripes. The male has similar horns. This one over here is the nyala, female. She doesn't have horns. There's the male nyala. It has stripes. It has horns. This one over here is the bongo. It has the same fusions. It has stripes. It has the same twirled horns. This one over here is a small little antelope. It's called the sitatunga. It has stripes. It has horns. All different species, but banding study shows the same information. Is this one kind, yes or no? Oh, so how many went into the ark? <laughs> Here's the wolf. He has 78 chromosomes. 78 short chromosomes. They are the foxes and the other canines. They can have from 30-something, 30 38 chromosomes, to 78. If they have 38 chromosomes, then they're long chromosomes. If they have 78 chromosomes, they're short chromosomes. So they looked and they said, hang on a second. That's the same information that you have in the wolf. So, all the canines, and we know that they can even interbreed. If you take the dingo in Australia, why is it endangered? Because it breeds with a do domestic dog. If you take the wolf and you take the coyote, if you take Ontario, the coyotes are larger than elsewhere. Why? Because they're a mixture between wolf and coyote. So, with genetic separation by putting them onto different chromosomes, sometimes they become infertile, but the information is exactly the same. Question, of all the wild dogs, all the wolves, all the coyotes, all the wild canines in the whole world, how many went onto the ark? One pair. That's it. Can you see the number of animals going into the ark just shrinking dramatically? Can you see that? All right. There's the dog race on the left over here. That's the variety you can get. That's built-in variety. On the right over here are wild animals. They're all different species, but they have the same chromosome banding patterns. They're one kind. One kind. Robertsonian fusion is another chromosome fusion. Mice, for example, have this. You have the house mouse, Mus musculus. You have the field mouse, Mus, mus pasiovinus. Who cares what they're called? It's just names to irritate students. But nevertheless, their chromosome numbers differ, but banding studies show the same information. You have jumping genes in the gene system. You can take a gene, cut it out, put it into another place, and instantly go from a small mouse to a giant mouse. Wow! So you just take a gene out, splice it into a position where it's read more often, and you have a giant mouse. Instantly. If you splice that gene one letter too far, what will the gene read? Has to be perfect. These are all mechanisms that are in the genotype. You either have to believe Boom! New York City. Or you have to believe in a designer. Because that's what we're dealing with. Chance or design. Giant mouse. Small mouse. So, built-in variety in the gene pool. That's what you have in the dogs. All that built-in variety. Reproductive exchange. The fact that we are male and female. By the way, I'm looking at my clock. I've been motoring like a, like a maniac. So, let me just run this by you. The Bible says that Eve was taken from whom? Isn't that neat? Eve was taken from Adam. Now I want to tell you today that I have every single gene that it takes to be a woman. Every single gene that it takes to be a woman. Has a woman got every single gene that it takes to be a man? No. no. She doesn't have a Y chromosome. So ladies, you must have come from man and not man from the woman. <laughs> Isn't that so? All right, ladies, you were taken from the side, not to be the head, but not to be trampled underfoot either. Equal partners. Equal partners. But you were taken from the man. It's the only one that makes any sense. It could not have been the other way around. It's impossible. So reproductive exchange. 
independent assorting during meiosis. Remember, it can go this way, that way. That's the 80 trillion offspring that I could have produced. And then I have crossing over during meiosis, such a complex mechanism that scientists are still boggled with how it works. It is so beautiful, the mechanism. It is so complicated. You cannot even believe it. Do you know what? You first have to unwind the DNA. Then you have to get a, an enzyme to cut the one strand. And then you have to get an enzyme to cut the other strand. Then you have to cross-link them. To do that, you have to da -da 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 turn it around. You have enzymes releasing the tension. You have enzymes attaching to either side of the DNA, and the DNA unwinds. Have you tried that? If I have a piece of string, two, two strings wrapped around each other, you take the one side and I take the other side, and you start unwinding. Yeep! What happens in the middle? It's, the knot gets tighter and tighter, right? That's what DNA does. That's what DNA does. Yet every time you replicate, you have to actually relieve that tension. Wow, how do you do that? Well, there's a ball-bearing joint enzyme in the middle that as you start pulling here on the sides, it cuts and allows free rain and then splices it together again. Then as you pull some more, it goes carries on like that. It is such a complicated mechanism. And then you have enzymes running up and down. The one is adding at thousands of nucleotides per second. Not making a mistake. A to T, A to T, A to T, G to C, G to C, C to G, and brrr, at a tremendous speed. I've got millions of genes. The job has to be finished within a few minutes when the cell divides. Not one mistake. Then I've got a whole host of enzymes coming afterwards called editors. Nice name, editors. Going tick, 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 tick. Checking, are there any spelling mistakes in this? Because we'd hate you to be cabbages when you, once you come out, right? No spelling mistakes. And you must now believe that that came about by chance. It's your only choice because it's genotype. I want to tell you that every single one of those mechanisms is more complicated than what man has ever devised with all his ingenuity. And yet it came about by chance. So let's go to these creatures. Look at all these different ones. Do you have a problem with those birds looking all different after this lecture? No. But, if you look at the human race, we say, where did this all come from? Well, look at them. Those are the women of the world. And I'm showing them to you first because, let's face it, they are far more attractive than uh, the males. But I'd like you to note, please, that in the animal world, the male is the beautiful of the species. Any bird, you just look at the hummingbird or any creature, the male is the star. But in women, I guess it's just a little bit different. But she came out of whom? <laughs> all right, there are the men. They might all look different, handsome as they are. There are some couples. And there are some kids. Now, kids are great to work with, because if you look at them, they're all cute, aren't they? No matter what rice, what tribe, what nation they come from, they're all cute. So let's have a quick glimpse at this issue. Adam and Eve, they must have had the built-in variety for everything that we have on the planet today. Is that right? Yeah. So I would reckon they weren't snowy white, and they weren't totally black. There was something in between. And the capacity to get all of that was built in. One of them must have had brown eyes. Brown is dominant. It could have had recessive eyes of another other color. And there could have been all the recessive genes for all the other colors. Maybe Eve also had brown eyes, but she could also have had blue eyes or any one of those. Today, if one parent is brown-eyed and the other one is blue-eyed, then you can have any combination provided that the father has recessive blue. All right? If both parents have blue eyes, that means they have the recessive gene only. If their child then has brown eyes, it means that the father is the postman. Okay? 
So Adam and Eve had every single gene it takes to make all the races of man. And had all the possible trays to make all the different races. Darwin comes along and he says, no, survival of the fittest. The persecutions and the racism that we have in the world, some of it directly linked back, like the Aborigines in Australia, were hunted because of Darwinian concepts. Darwin, Darwinism lays the foundation for racism. God, as we see, is a lover of variety. So much built-in variety. If you look at the fruits of the world, if you look at, that's another question in itself, fruit. It has every single nutrient that we need. But the plant doesn't need it for its seed. The seed is enough. So what's the fruit for? Is a banana a good way to propagate seed? It doesn't even need it. But it's got everything that you and I need. This is all evidence of creation. This is evidence for design. And you have these two great choices that we have to make in our life today. So here you have a fruit fly. This has been bombarded with more technology and evolutionary processes than anything else. You'll see there are fruit flies with brown eyes, with red eyes, with white eyes, with one body, with two bodies, with one wing pair, with two pairs, with no pairs, with short wings, with long wings, but it's always fruit flies. How many tunes can I play on a piano? Unlimited tunes, but it's always piano music. How many tunes can I play on a violin? Unlimited number of tunes, but it's always violin music. That's how it works. God built in mechanisms for variety. So if Darwin, having traveled to the Galapagos Islands, had known that God built in variety, different alleles, God increases variety enormously through all the processes that we've gone through, would he have had a problem with his finches, yes or no? No. He would have said, wow, they had the capacity to change and produce all of this, just like we can produce the Chihuahua and the Great Dane out of the wolf. What a wonderful creator. Would we have had racism today on this planet had we known that God created variety for the enjoyment of all? If you go to Africa, and the African people are... How shall I put this? The African people are event oriented. We will meet and the party starts when we are all there. <laughs> the German people in the world are what? Time oriented. The party will start at 8 o'clock precisely, yeah? <laughs> at 5 part, past 8, the guests are not there. The wife has a nervous breakdown. <laughs> at 10 past 8, they're in the loony bin. Have you ever been to Germany? In Italy, if the start party starts at 8 o'clock and the guests are not there, if the guests arrive at 8 o'clock, the wife has a nervous breakdown because they shouldn't have been there for another two hours, right? <laughs> In Africa, the party starts maybe the next day. Depends whether everybody's got there or not. And when it does start, it doesn't stop. So where would you like to go for a relaxing holiday? Germany or Africa? <laughs> you know, the different mindsets are just different. And if we know that God is a lover of variety, then we can experience the beauty of different flowers, different aspects of our lives, different ways of thinking. Can you imagine two lovers, both nuclear physicists, and two lovers, both lovers of classical music, coming together on their first date? Can you imagine how different that experience will be? totally different, but it can be totally beautiful, right? I mean, there's lots of beauty in the atom and physics, and there's lots of beauty in notes and things like that. Let us become appreciators of the variety that God has given this planet. And the choice you can make tonight is, remember this, either we have a designer God, or we have a bum little house. Choose ye this day. Thank you.